When I was a kid, both of my parents had to constantly work overtime at dead-end jobs just to keep the lights on and food on the table. This meant not only did we have to live very frugally, but I also didn't get to spend time with them nearly as often as a kid should. It wasn't all bad. At the very least, I knew my mom and dad cared about me and would do anything to make my life a little easier, even if they were barely ever around to show it. We were also lucky enough to live in a neighborhood that, while relatively poor, was full of neighbors who looked out for each other. But our biggest saving grace was my uncle, Chris. He was, to put it lightly, loaded. Though I never found out the specifics of what he did for a living, I knew that he had some sort of position at NASA. Even with his busy lifestyle, he still found time to visit us at least once a month to help us pay the bills and sometimes to bring a little something special for me. Despite Chris's frequent visits to our house, however, I have to admit, he never really felt like he was a part of our family. Sure, he was nice and all, but every time I looked at him, he had an unreadable look on his face, like his mind was somewhere far away from our shabby home. He never felt like he belonged, even at large get-togethers, with all manners of wacky characters showing up at our house. This wasn't held by the presents that he gave me. They were always from his work, always given to me with little to no explanation, and always weird. One time during the holidays, he handed me a glowing rock. Yep, a straight up glowing rock, without saying what it was or why it was glowing. It stopped glowing after a week and it just became a normal rock, but still. Another time on my birthday, he handed me a handful of what he called special eggs and told me to put them in the water. I assumed at the time that they would hatch into sea monkeys or something of that kind, but instead, they turned the water black and made the house smell like sulfur, leading me to hurriedly dump the whole thing into a storm drain. As I got older, the frequency of Chris's visits and of the presents gradually began to decrease. My parents expressed their sympathies, as they themselves couldn't afford much for me on special occasions. But I think secretly, they were glad not to have to put up with whatever Chris decided to bring into our house next. Nevertheless, Chris continued to support us financially, and as selfish as it sounds, I think we were content to accept his money without having to actually interact with him. And then one day, when I was on winter break at around 15 years old, he showed up unannounced. It had been snowing all evening, and my mother had finished preparing a meager meal of chicken soup on the gas stove. We were just sitting down to eat when the knock on the door came and he was standing there, tall and broad-shouldered and covered in white powder, looking like an oversized snowman. Mom expressed her surprise and excitement. He was still her brother, after all, and pulled him into a hug in the doorway. He simply patted her on the back, his eyes as far away as always. After sitting down with us, Chris explained that he had been working very hard at his department at NASA for the past few years, but he had recently accomplished something very big, allowing him to take some time off to rest. Of course, he wouldn't say what he had accomplished. He always had been secretive about his job like that. But we didn't want to get him in trouble for revealing classified info or anything like that. So we never pressed for details. Oh, Eli. He said suddenly, and turning to me. This startled me enough to spill a bit of soup onto my lap, lightly singeing my legs through my pants. Chris rarely called me by my name, and almost never expressed any actual interest in talking to me as he did now. Yeah? What is it, Uncle Chris? I answered, trying my best to sound polite. I brought a little something for you from work. 
After dinner, how about you come help me try it out? I saw my parents exchange tired, knowing looks, not only at the return of Chris's infamous presence, but at the fact that this one was one that apparently needed to be tried out. But still, he had been paying our bills for all these years. The least we could do was let him stay with us for a bit, and to entertain whatever it was that he had had planned for me. Chris got up from the table early, telling me to stay put and walking out the front door. From the window, I saw him rummaging around the trunk of his car, and before lifting out a sizable cardboard box, and disappearing from view as he carried it around the back of our house. A few minutes later, I heard the back door open and Chris's voice calling for me to come outside. I looked at my mom, who simply nodded, as if to say, go out there and humor the guy. After putting on my ratty coat and my water damaged boots, I stepped out into the snow covered yard, mentally preparing myself to see whatever knickknack he had stolen from Area 51. It had stopped snowing at that point, and as my eyes adjusted to the dying light, I was surprised to see that it was just a telescope. No fancy levers or babbles attached. It looked about as ordinary as telescopes go. He smiled when he saw me, or at least attempted to do what he thought a smile looked like. Sorry I couldn't get you something cooler, kiddo. Oh no, this, this is great. I replied, quickly realizing the relief in my voice could be easily mistaken for insincerity. Maybe it was better that way. Maybe it was better that he didn't know a normal present was all that I'd ever really wanted. Well, he said, might as well show you the robes. He proceeded to show me how to work the telescope, how to adjust the focus, and when that was done, enough stars had come out for him to show me how to find a few famous constellations. I was having so much fun, I had barely noticed how late it had gotten. Chris paused in his explanations to let out a yawn, and it was only then that I had realized just how tired he looked. And the bags under his distant eyes were much deeper than they were the last time that I had seen him. And perhaps this so-called project at NASA really had taken its toll on him. When my mom came out to check on us, Chris told us that he would better go to bed now. I asked mom if I could stay out for a little bit longer and work on the telescope on my own. And she agreed. As long as I came in if it got too cold. I think she was just happy that I had the opportunity to play with something normal for once. As the night wore on, I continued to gaze into the eyepiece, observing the clear night sky in detail that I had never experienced before. I could see the star-dusted arms of the Milky Way, individual craters on the moon, and I even convinced myself that I had found Jupiter and I was looking at its own moons. Eventually. Even my parents went to bed, leaving me out in the cold, silent darkness with only the stars to keep me company. I paused to look up from the eyepiece, my left eye slightly sore from being squinted shut. I turned around to look at the dark silhouettes of my house behind me, but in the process, my foot caught on an especially slippery patch of ground, bringing me down with it. I winced hoping that I hadn't sprained it for my mom's sake. I crawled back to where I was pretty sure the telescope was, gripping onto one of the legs to pull myself up. As I was doing so, I paused. On the underside of the device, there was a dial that I hadn't seen yet. Chris had claimed to show me every function of the telescope, but apparently he had left one part out. Straining my eyes in the darkness, I could make out the notch the dial was currently set to, labeled simply, one. I looked back at the house again, wondering for a split second whether I should wake Chris up and ask him about it, but my curiosity overpowered my doubts that I had. After all, it was just a normal telescope, right? 
I grabbed the dial and I turned it slowly to the left, until I heard a small click. Now it was set to another notch, labeled 2. I pulled myself up the rest of the way up onto my feet, eagerly looking back into the eyepiece to see what had changed. And when I did, I couldn't stop a cold gasp of wonder from escaping my lips. And the telescope had been pointing at the moon, which now looked so close, it was as if I could touch it. I could see individual pebbles lying on the floors of each crater, and I was sure that if I looked hard enough, I would be able to count the stars on the American flag. And then I found Jupiter again, and I laughed in delight when I was able to see the great red spot clearly in all its swirling glory, with the occasional dot of a moon passing in front of it. The level of detail I was getting now was sheer amazement, not even comparable to what I had been seeing before. I wondered why Chris hadn't mentioned the dial. The dial which seemed to unlock the humble telescope's true potential. And then I realized that maybe this wasn't a humble telescope at all. Maybe it had something to do with Chris's latest project at NASA. But still, Chris had never been careful about giving me gifts and he had never obscured features of them from me. For him to suddenly be hiding secrets about something, it was out of character. In the end, I reassured myself that he had probably just forgotten to tell me about the dial, and it wasn't anything that I needed to worry about. I reached down to switch it back to its default setting, planning to find it again in the morning and ask Chris about it then. My hand faltered before it reached the dial. There was an additional notch that I hadn't seen. It was labeled, 3. I seriously debated what to do in that moment. It was getting absurdly late and I was already chilled down to the bone. Who knows what new discovery I would make, and how much more of the night that it would take up. But this time, I made absolutely sure there were no more notches left in the dial. This was definitely the last one, and so I promised myself that it would be the last thing I checked out before bed. I grabbed it and I turned. It didn't budge. I looked closer at the tiny printed at number three. There appeared to be a minuscule keyhole under the third notch, and it was my best guess that some sort of mechanism was preventing the dial from turning any further. Well, that was that. If I needed a key to get to the third notch, it clearly wasn't something that I needed to be messing around with without Chris. I turned the dial back to one, yawned, and I walked back inside. The inside of her house was just as dark and silent as the outside now. My parents had retreated to their tiny bedroom upstairs, and I was about to do the same to my own room in the loft before I caught sight of Chris sleeping on the old couch in the living room. It was where he always used to sleep, back when he made regular house calls, and hearing his light snores would give me an odd pang of nostalgia from the days when he would visit normally, usually during festivities and hand me something probably illegal. Tonight was a bit different from those days though. For one thing, Chris had had his briefcase next to him, on the floor beside the couch, the mysterious briefcase that I had seen him handle many times, but that he always kept in his car. And perhaps in his exhaustion, he had forgotten to leave it there. If that was true then, he also had forgotten to close it. The white pseudo glow of manila folders caught my eye in the dim room. Confidential folders spilling out of the briefcase that I had always wondered about. I felt my feet taking steps towards it. And knowing they shouldn't but being unable to resist the pull of what else might lie within. I was close enough now that if Chris woke up, there would be no excuse for me to be standing here. I squatted down, gazing into the darkness of that briefcase, wondering if I would find answers to questions that I didn't have. In the bottom, glinting in the weak moonlight streaming in through the frosted windows, I spotted a tiny, 
chromatic key labeled with the number three. Okay, Eli. I said after a short mental skirmish with myself, all you're gonna do is see if the key fits, and then you're gonna put it back where it came from and go to bed. No harm done, no questions asked. My heart fluttered as I pocketed the key, feeling as if I had just stolen government secrets and the cops are gonna come in and bust down my door at any minute. But I had already come this far and there was no stopping me now. Running stealthily back out the door, I hurried to the telescope to see if it would work. It did. There was one click and then another, as I turned the dial from one to two, and finally to three. The third notch took a little more effort, as if it was sticky, or as if it wasn't meant to be turned. I aimed the lens at a clear patch of sky with only a few distant stars in the way, just to give me a bit of legroom for what I'd be able to see through the eyepiece now. No amount of legroom could have prepared me for that. When I looked into the eyepiece, at first, I couldn't quite make sense of what I was seeing. It was only abstract blobs to me. But as the focus adjusted, I realized that I was no longer looking into the void of space. It looked like some sort of desert. A gray, sandblasted desert with towering dunes and a brooding, amber sky crackling with distant lightning. And facing each other on one of the dunes were two things. I don't exactly have a word for what the texture of their exteriors looked like. That's probably because I had never seen anything that did look like them. The closest I can think to describe them is rock-like, with cracks and crevices in their skin, but somehow still flexible. Their bodies were tall and tapered, wider at the bottom and separating at the top into two long appendages that amusingly resembled bunny ears. Or at least, it would have been amusing if it hadn't scared me out of my skin. The two beings were hovering slightly above the surface of the harsh desert, and if I didn't know any better, I would say that they were conversing with one another. I didn't see any facial features, but they seemed to be moving slightly in turns, as if to exchange words. And then abruptly, they stopped. The one closer to me began to turn around, and as it did, I was slowly introduced to two burning holes in its surface. Two white-hot eyes that, despite lacking any accompanying features, instantly let me know that they were furious. Furious to have been spot on by somebody like me. But wait, that didn't make any sense. How could this thing, this impossibly far thing, know that I was looking at it? The distance between us must have been unbelievable then, and yet, did it see me? Without any warning, the closer thing, the one that had seen me began to move, fast and toward me. The charcoal sand of the desert below was whipped up into a frenzy as it whirled closer and closer until it took up my field of vision with its gray skin. I yelped wrenching myself away from the telescope and falling backwards out of my butt. My head swiveled around rapidly, as if to search for an incoming threat. But there was none. The snowy yard was just as empty, just as silent as it had been all night. I was still here, and whatever I had seen was still all the way out there. Cautiously, I took another look into the eyepiece, it was still all gray. I turned the dial back to setting two, and the calm and familiar view of outer space was returned to me. As my heart rate slowed back to normal, I decided the cold must have been getting to me, and getting some sleep now would be my best option. I'm sure Uncle Chris would have a good explanation in the morning, and that would be that. As much as I reassured myself, I wasn't able to get anything more than a restless night of sleep. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of an unfamiliar voice shouting. 
After a few seconds, I realized that it was Chris. I had pretty much never heard him raise his voice before, so even in my groggy state, I could tell that something was seriously wrong. I made my way downstairs to find Chris and my parents standing in the living room, appearing to be engaged in a one-sided argument. Chris was pacing around, rambling about missing something, and my parents, both of whom were already late for work, stood there anxiously checking the clock. It was only after my mother managed to get a word in that he calmed down somewhat. Alright, alright, I understand that you're upset, but could you just describe what it is that we're looking for here, so we can actually help you? I've already told you a thousand times. It's a tiny silver key and it was in my case last night, and now it isn't. You got that? I felt my heart sink. Shit, I never put it back. There was no point hiding it from him. I came clean right then and there. I told Chris that I took the key and what I had used it for last night. I wasn't expecting to get off completely for stealing it, but I at least expected him to calm down now that he knew where it was. Quite the opposite happened. His already pale face was drained of what little blood it had left. You two can go to work. He barred towards my parents, an unusually assertive comment from him. They were already late though, and they were likely glad to be free of his shenanigans. Once they were out the door, he turned to face me with his frenzied eyes. Show me exactly where you put it. I led Chris outside to where the telescope still stood in the snow, a fresh dusting lightly covering its shiny black surface. I pointed to the tiny key, still in the slot where I had placed it to unlock the third notch. Chris urgently bent down, turning the dial from 1 to 3 again and looking into the eyepiece. After a moment, he looked back at me, his eyes finally here and not somewhere else, and he said only one thing. You need to leave. And that's the story of how my family got set up in a new luxury modern home on a secluded rural property. Chris never explained why he bought a new home for us, nor why it was so far away from our old one, but of course my parents were ecstatic about it. They were a little sad to leave our old friends of the old neighborhood in the past, but that was a small price to pay for a better life. I never told my parents what had happened that night either. I didn't want them to worry about me. Chris still sent us the occasional check, but now that we were so well off thanks to him, we didn't need much of his help anymore. Eventually, he stopped sending us anything, he stopped coming to our house and stopped communicating with us altogether. We forgot about him, and I forgot about what I had seen in the telescope. My parents were able to get decent jobs and after a few years, I moved out and I got my own place. Everything was well. Until this morning. I was balancing the budget for my new house while the local news from my town was playing on the flat screen in the same room. It was just background noise really. I wasn't paying much attention to what was actually going on. Not until I happened to look up at the right moment. To catch something that made me do a double take. An extremely grainy photograph was displayed on the screen, the kind that could only be of something very far away. Outer space levels of far away. This was reaffirmed by the black background and fuzzy white dots scattered across the background of the photo. But what stuck out to me was the dark, grayish blur in the center of the photograph. It shouldn't have meant anything to me, and yet it did because this particular blur had a long, tapered shape, and it ended in what resembled like long bunny ears. Suddenly, everything that happened that night came back to me, and now I desperately needed to know the context of this image, fumbling for the remote and cranking up the volume. In other news, astronomers recently spotted this piece of debris as it rapidly entered our solar system yesterday morning. Why its unusual shape may pique the interest of some, we are told that it is no cause for alarm, 
as dozens of meteors and other small space debris swing by planet Earth every single year. The recent meteor shower last weekend should be proof of this, of course. Oh, were you able to catch that, Sam? I had to work that night. I did indeed, Katie. And it was beautiful, as they say. I'll send you a video sometime. And now, here's the weather. The sounds of the TV meant nothing to me, as they were replaced by the pounding of dread in my ears. I wanted to call Chris, to call somebody who would understand. But I realized that I hadn't had his number in years. I don't know who else I can talk to about this, but I do know one thing. That debris isn't going to simply swing by planet Earth. It's coming for me. After the events of the past 24 hours, and now that I'm in a position to post them, I feel that it's my duty to share them with you. Let me start by going back to the point right after I heard the news of the space debris on the TV. I spent most of the minutes immediately afterward pacing around my living room, racking my brain as to what the hell anyone was supposed to do in the situation. Uh, I could call my parents, as they would probably think that it was some sort of prank call and just hang up. If I reported an alien rapidly approaching my location to 911, I would more likely get thrown into a mental ward. And of course, my uncle was off the table. To call my condition a panic attack, it would have been an understatement. I was about to take shelter in an unfinished basement and hope for the best, when a knock came from my door. Turns out, I didn't need to call anybody after all. I hadn't seen Chris for almost six years, and yet, I instantly recognized the man who stood outside of my house. He was balder, his stubble more unkempt, his posture slouchier, and his eyes obscured by opaque shades. But he was still the tall, broad-shouldered man of mystery that I had always known. Uncle Chris. The words tripped over each other as they spilled from my mouth in both relief and confusion. How did you find where I live? You probably already know why I'm here. Chris replied, his voice hoarse and worn out. So I think it's in both of our best interests to skip the formalities and just get the hell out of here. The man paused to look down at his expensive as always watch. Shit, it's passing through the asteroid belt now, and we only have a few hours left. Should I, should I pack? I looked back into my house with uncertainty, the TV on. Paperwork strewn across the coffee table. I was still in a state of disbelief that any of this was happening. You want to die because you took too long to choose your undies. Car, now. Chris seemed a lot rougher around the edges now than I had ever seen him before in the past. It made me wonder what he had been up to since we lost contact, and how it had changed him. Right then though, Doing what he said and not questioning why he said it was my best option. My only option, really. Okay, let me just turn off the... No time! Chris grabbed me by the arm. Despite his clear signs of aging, he was still just as strong as ever, and he practically dragged me into the front seat of his car before I could even shut the door. Several of my neighbors were out mowing her water in their lawns, like an alien was an inbound towards Earth at Mach 5, and they gave odd looks at the stranger pulling me into his vehicle. I flashed a pleasant smile at them, just to dissolve any worries or urges to call the police that they may have had. I sure as hell didn't need anybody else coming after me. Chris drove like a madman through the winding streets, and it was only when he entered the interstate and our surroundings became nothing but flat, empty farmland that I felt safe enough to stop gripping the edge of my seat and actually say something to the guy who had just borderline kidnapped me. So, uh, I was assuming you would be telling me, but you want to give me any info on the thing? After a moment of silence, I thought perhaps Chris hadn't heard me or didn't know what I was referring to with the word thing. I was about to clarify 
but the emergence of a long, harrowed sigh from the man's mouth signaled he knew exactly what I meant, and clearly he didn't enjoy talking about it. A small unknown terrestrial planet orbiting a star about 500 light years from Earth. That's its point of origin. As you probably figured out, it's been coming after you for the past six years, which means its peak velocity is somewhere able to greatly exceed light speed. Like any moving object though, it needs to slow down when approaching its destination, which means it reduced its speed exponentially the moment it entered our system. Of course, that buys us a little time to get you somewhere safe, but not much. And it's less and less time for every second that I spend explaining this to you. For the sake of my own life, I respected Chris's request, not asking him anything else throughout the drive and not even attempting to turn on the radio. Instead, I watched the cloudless sky out the window, wondering if the creature was somewhere above Earth's orbit right now. After what seemed like hours of deserted farmland, Chris turned onto a small country road and then onto an even smaller gravel path. At last approaching what looked more like a prison than anything related to NASA. A stark, unmarked concrete building with no windows, surrounded by a chain link fence topped with barbed wire. I wanted desperately to ask what this place was, but I remained silent up until the point he stopped the car in front of the facility, and turning towards me to speak. Eli, I was careless, I will admit that now. I shouldn't have given you something that even I was barely trusted to have. It's my fault that you're in this mess to begin with. I'm sorry. I was stunned for a brief moment, both because he was capable of apologizing for being such a weird uncle, and also because he would choose now of all times to do so, before quickly formulating my own reply. It's okay, Uncle Chris. It's partly my fault anyway. I was a stupid kid and I shouldn't have stolen your key. Either way, I forgive you. Good. Now let's get the hell out of this car. We ran across the gravel and into the entrance of the compound, guarded by what appeared to be two armed soldiers. Since when does NASA need guards? It's a blur in my memory what had happened next, but I knew that we ran past many armed guards and people in white coats and unfamiliar machinery before entering an elevator and going down for what felt like an eternity. Though we were alone again in the said elevator, I still refrained from speaking. What was I supposed to say at that point? Luckily, when the doors finally opened, there was something waiting there to break the silence. A stout, bespeckled man in one of those white coats stood in the long, dim, concrete tunnel into which we had merged. When he caught sight of us, his face lit up. Christopher, long time no see. He approached my uncle, giving him an enthusiastic handshake that was only half-heartedly returned before grabbing my own hand. You must be Elijah. You can call me Dr. Roth. I've heard a lot about you, you know. Oh, that's good, I guess. I forced a smile out of common courtesy, my hand aching from his death grip. We've been tracking your location for the past six years, Eli, Chris explained. Not in a creepy way, and we still gave you your privacy. We just needed to know where you were so we could get to you safely when the time came. The bunker you're standing in was designed by Dr. Roth himself, and it should be able to resist the presence of any and all extraterrestrial beings. Dr. Roth nodded in admiration of himself. That's right. No way, no how, binoculars standing up to human ingenuity. Binocula? I saw Chris roll his eyes. It's a nickname for the thing. Pay no mind to it, he's always coming up with shit like that. Well, it is accurate, I pointed out, doing a figurative faceplant on an attempt to inject some humor into the conversation. You're safe now, Dr. Rose said, but we still have a bit of time before Binocula pays us a visit. In the meantime, there's something that I would like to show you. Shall we? 
He beckoned further into the tunnel. I looked at Chris who nodded begrudgingly, and we both began to follow the doctor into the bunker. For a bunker, it seemed to go on a lot longer than it needed to, especially if it was only meant to protect one person. It seemed like an entire new floor to the compound, with various doors in the curved metal walls leading off to god knows what. At last, Dr. Rose stopped in front of one particular door at the far end of the tunnel, and turning to face us. I should mention, everything you've seen here is highly confidential. Not even high-level personnel at NASA know about it. So, I'm gonna need to take your phone and have you promise not to leak any of this to anyone. Uh, of course, I replied, handing him the phone. It was a small sacrifice in return for being somewhere Binocula couldn't get me. The doctor gave me a gracious smile as he pocketed the device. Your parents have been notified of your absence as well, of course. They've been told that you're on a faraway business trip to limit any chances of them contacting you. Now, without further ado, Dr. Roth punched some code into the metal door, and it opened with a loud screech resonating through the tunnel. He flourished his arm in a welcoming motion, ushering us in, before following suit and shutting the door behind him. The room beyond had a strangely high ceiling, seeming to stretch far beyond the bunker, exceeding the boundaries of what would have been able to protect me. But that didn't faze me, because my focus was on what occupied all that space. Stacked high to the ceiling were dozens and dozens of cardboard boxes. What's in them? I wondered out loud, my voice echoing throughout the chamber. Dr. Roll strolled past me until he reached the base of the cardboard mountain, reaching for one of the boxes that stood by itself on the floor. With surprising strength, he tore back the cardboard flaps until the contents of the destroyed box stood fully exposed. Look familiar? My eyes widened in recognition. It was disassembled, but I still recognized the parts of the telescope. Well, not the telescope, but the same model. An exact replica of the one Chris had given me all those years ago. Could all of the boxes in this room really contain one? Chris stepped further into the room behind me, his hands stuffed in his pockets. Dr. Roth was a partner of mine for a good number of years. He and I worked together to design a scope that could be able to closely observe worlds many light years away from our own. I mostly handled manufacturing of components, but Rose the real mastermind behind the project. In fact, he's the only person who actually knows how it works. Mm-hmm. Dr. Roth concurred. No other telescopes like these exist outside this room. I continued to stare up at the dizzying heights of the stacked boxes. Um, but I don't get it. Why did you keep making so many? Wasn't the first one too dangerous to be kept around? I've been asking myself the same question for years. I heard Chris mutter under his breath. Dr. Roth walked back to me until he was standing directly on my side, turning his head up towards the ceiling to mirror my own. Oh, well, the answer to that is very simple. You see, your uncle thought that your experience with the telescope was a sign we should abandon the project completely. But I, on the other hand, saw it for what it really was. An incredible opportunity. We had been observing that planet's surface long before your uncle gave you the telescope. But you were the first to actually catch sign of its native life. How great a coincidence was that? I guess it was pretty lucky, I admitted. Withholding the fact that I wished that I had never seen that native life. No such thing as luck, Dr. Roth chuckled. This is the future, humanity's future. I'm sure you've heard the saying, offense is the best defense. Well, that applies both on our world and off it. Now that we can finally observe threats from a distance, humanity has the upper hand to anticipate attacks before they even happen. We can finally take the universe as our rightful domain, and destroy any opposing forces that get in our way. 
attacks, my brow furrowed, realizing that what Dr. Oath was saying was beginning not to make sense. But the creature I saw is attacking me, not the planet. Isn't that the only reason that it's here in the first place? Because I looked at it through the telescope. Before Dr. Roth could respond, an echoing boom sounded from above, seeming to shake the entire foundations of the compound. Yellow fluorescent lights flickered, small chunks of plaster and concrete showered down from the ceiling, and I swore that I could hear distant screaming. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Chris fumble to look at his watch, checking something that I couldn't see from this angle. When he looked back up, the unfamiliar presence of raw terror was in his eyes. Shit, it's here. Roth, we need to get back into the bunker now. Dr. Roth didn't move. Roth! Chris screamed in exasperation before dashing back to the door and attempting to wrench it open. But no luck, it was locked, and we were on the wrong side. My heart began to race as I realized that we were in an atrium, a perfect environment for something to crash down from several levels above. Had Dr. Roth planned this, why would he possibly want that thing to find us, to be in the same room as us, as me? I began to hear it, a sound that still turns my blood to ice when I think about it. The sound of multiple layers of steel and concrete being crushed to powder, as an unimaginable force forged its path directly down to where we were standing. It was headed right for me. Eli, help me get the door open. I heard Chris cry in his final act of desperation. I ran to help him, preparing to give it my all, and catching sight of Dr. Rose's face as I did. He was wearing a sickening smile. I never reached the door. The upper layer of the ceiling was penetrated instantly, sending shockwaves through the chamber and knocking me off my feet. I caught sight of something, a blur that was enormous and yet fast enough to appear almost graceful, shoot down to the floor. The tower of telescopes collapsed, glass flying everywhere. I raised my arm to protect myself, and when the barrage had stopped, I cautiously lowered it to the site I hoped that I would never see. It was here. It was about 10 feet tall, and its stone-like skin was heavy, a steam-like substance radiating from its body. It hovered just above the collapsed heap of glass and metal, its bunny ear appendages twitching, observing us just as I had observed it. And then abruptly, it hurled itself the rest of the way down onto the floor, breaking the already shattered telescopes into smaller pieces. It rose back up again, only to repeat the process, to continue to smash the telescopes, to relentlessly fling its body against the floor over and over again, until it made sure that not a single one was intact, until each and every shard of glass was pummeled to dust. I have no idea how long we sat there watching it, but I do remember the dread hanging in the air when it finally stopped and it continued to just stare at us. Fascinating. I heard Dr. Roth muttering from behind me. It was targeting the object that had observed it, but all along, the object was the telescope itself. No matter, I can always make more. I looked at Chris, the disbelief on his face disheartening. Not even he knew what was going on. What was happening right now had I been part of the plan. We briefly made eye contact and I think seeing me, seeing that I was still alive and kicking, was enough for him to get knocked out of his stupor. Raw, you crazy bastard! My uncle screamed. What the hell are you trying to do? Roth turned around, his face and voice disturbingly calm despite the presence of an otherworldly being right in front of him. I'm testing, Christopher. That's what our job has always been here, isn't it? This is simply one more test. If we are to bear witness to the behavior of this creature in an unrestricted environment, we are to better understand it. If we are to better understand it, we are to better destroy it. 
destruction is the only path to true progress, and it always requires a bit of sacrifice. Sacrifice? He was talking about me. My uncle still looked furious, but I could tell that he was tired. He had been working non-stop to prepare this place for me, and now that it had gone to waste, it was as if his purpose had been lost. When he pulled himself back to his feet and spoke again, it was in a low, panting growl, like an exhausted predator. This plan of yours, Roth, does it include locking yourself in with the sacrifice? Because, unless that thing simply lets you walk out of here, that's exactly what you've done. Dr. Roth laughed, a chilling, maniacal sound. Of course I can leave. I just have to wait for the right moment. Now that it has destroyed all things with the power to see it, it's going to destroy the thing that saw it in the first place. You can leave with me too, Christopher. While it's distracted with what it truly came for. Dr. Roth turned back around to face the creature. And I'm still not sure why, but what he did next deeply disturbed me. He began talking to it. His arms spread outward, flailing like mad. Well, why don't you just give in to your inferior primal urges? Finish your hunt. Destroy the one that you came here for. Destroy him so that we may destroy you. The creature continued to stare, its unblinking, white-hot eyes burning into each of us, passing judgment with wordless fury. It looked at me, at Uncle Chris, and back to the doctor, its body only slightly turning each time, hovering just above the ground with almost imperceptible stillness. And then, in one swift motion, it descended upon the doctor, and it absorbed him into its being. Both Chris and I cried out in alarm as the doctor's life was ended, with a muffled scream that dissolved into silence. My legs turned to jelly, unable to support my trembling body as I fell to my knees. I felt like cornered prey, petrified, unable to escape, as the creature began to slowly approach. I was sure that I was next, and that me and maybe Chris too were about to meet the same fate as the doctor. It stopped just a few feet away from me, and angled its levitating body downward so its white, radiant eyes were level with my own. We stared into each other, and somehow I could tell that it knew, it knew that I had never been the true threat. All it had wanted was to exist on its own world without interference, and through some unknown clairvoyance, it had realized that Dr. Roth challenged that existence. With the doctor and all of his creations gone, any chance of being observed, of targeted, of needlessly wiped out by an overaggressive force were gone. The creature felt safe now, and that was all that it had ever wanted. It backed away, leaving me breathless on the floor, my skin still pierced with the shards of glass it had shattered across the room. It floated back to the center of the chamber, until it was directly below the hole through which it had emerged, and then with unimaginable yet a silent speed, it rocketed upward into nothingness. It was gone. It's been about six hours since this all happened. Chris and I got our cuts treated, and he drove me back to my house. I know that I promised that I wouldn't post any information about the compound online, and I knew that if it's seen by anybody from Chris's department, whatever the hell that is, it might get taken down. But I know that no harm will come to me. I don't know when I'll see Chris again. But I do know that if he's willing to protect me from aliens and crazy scientists, a few government hitmen should be no problem. The last thing Chris told me before he left was that besides a gaping hole in the NASA facility, there was no evidence left behind of the creature ever being on Earth. It had been so fast, there wasn't even any evidence of it entering the atmosphere in the first place. If I'm being honest, that's probably for the best and not just because they don't want to be on the news. 
if there is one thing that I've learned, it's that there are some things in this universe that simply want to be left to their own devices. And as long as you let them be, no harm will come to you or your world. But if you do decide to interfere, you've been warned. This is Elijah, signing off.